what is up youtube people welcome back to my channel unless this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed sis if it's your first time here you've been missing out you've been missing out and you will not be disappointed unless you're a hater and if you are unfortunately there's no cure for that i don't think it's a cure for that is there a cure for that nope sorry so sorry about it can't help you i'm gonna let y'all know off the rip i don't know what's going on with me right now but mother has been a little sensitive so while i was researching this one child i cried a little bit so i might cry today i don't know we gonna see i'm gonna try not to but you know how i do and you know what not to forget that i'm still a thug out here in these streets thugs cry too rick ross he made a whole song about it today's video is a little bit different than things we've covered here in the past on the channel but it is still a very interesting story and so let's just get into it. Sandra Harold was born in Stamford, Connecticut in 1938. Her parents, they owned a very popular bakery downtown and so they made a cute little coin, a nice amount of money. Sandra is an only child. She was afforded all of the nice things. Her parents realized very early on that she really, really liked animals and because she's an only child, they decide that they're gonna get her a German Shepherd who somebody names Gretchen girl. I don't know if it was little Sandra or her family but somebody names the dog Gretchen. Nevertheless Gretchen is like her best friend. She spends most of her time with the dog. They're literally always together. In the family portrait she'll be dressed all extravagantly nice and classy and then little Gretchen will be right there by her side. Like they were literally inseparable. The family had also at some point in time gotten a stable of horses and she also loved the horses too. She just loved animals period. Little Sandra was the animal lover like a lot of us. Her childhood is pretty typical of a child who was born into a nice family who had nice loving parents. From what I read, it didn't seem like the typical like rich family vibes where they have the kid and they kind of just send them off to board at school and don't pay attention to them anymore. It didn't sound like she had that kind of childhood. She really had loving parents who paid attention to her. Almost immediately after high school, Sandra gets married, but this marriage does not last long. In 1960, she enters her second marriage and it is intense and romantic and it's nothing like the first one. Like this was the one in her eyes. She loved her husband. He was very loving to her as well. Things are coasting along a lot better than her first marriage. And she is elated when she finds out that she is pregnant with her first child. She has a baby girl that she named Susan. When I say she loved this little girl with all of her heart, Susan was her world. But unfortunately, about four years into her marriage with Susan's father, things go sour. And again, she is divorced. She is now in her late 20s. She's a single mom. And luckily for her, she does find love again when she meets a man by the name of Jerry Harold. Jerry was described as being very kind, very intelligent, highly devoted to the relationship. Not only that, Gerald also cared for and looked after Susie as his own daughter. And so she decides, you know what? This is all the makings of a good husband and a good man. That's a good man, Savannah. I'm gonna marry him. The two get married. And he officially assumes the role of Susie's father. The two settle in a nice little house together. Jerry was very much business oriented and business savvy and then of course Sandra is as well because she comes from entrepreneurship so she knows all of the things about turning a coin into a business and so they open up several businesses one being a towing company they also had an auto body shop and these businesses ultimately make them millionaires like they make a lot of money. Now, one of Sandra's little rich woman activities was attending the rodeo. She enjoyed the rodeo a lot because, of course, she loved the horses and she just loved the whole rodeo thing, okay? During one of these trips to the rodeo, she meets an 18-year-old runaway, Charlotte Nash. Despite their 12-year age gap, two of them they get along pretty well they click hit it off right away the two form a very very close friendship they would often meet up at the rodeo together and you know do things that people who share common interests do right now one day while they're at the rodeo they are very much amused when a little chimpanzee dressed in western wear comes out and rides a horse around the ring and they think it's just the cutest thing ever like it kind of is cute imagine a little chimp dressed up like a cowboy riding a horse adorable right sandra was determined to get backstage to meet the little champ and shake his little hand and girl just tell him how cute he is so they go backstage and she is given the opportunity to formally meet the champ he seems just as happy to see her as she is to see him child he jumped into her arms and snatched her candy and she thought that was just the cutest funniest thing ever not for me girl Snatching candy is fighting actions okay and i understand he a little chimp or whatever baby but if you can if you can throw you can catch 
okay? If you can throw your little hands, you can catch hands as well. Anyway, she's just so amused by him. She goes home and she tells Gerald about it and she's like, I would love to have one of my own. And Gerald is like, girl, we have all of the animals here, okay? Which they did. They had their own horses and a bunch of dogs. And so they had a very hectic home life, but she enjoyed it. Like she really delighted in taking care of and establishing relationships with animals and caring for them. She is also, of course, raising her daughter, Susan. And so it's kind of not the best idea for her to go out there and get a chimp, at least not right now. She can actually somewhat agree with that and see where he's coming with that. So she puts the whole idea of getting a chimp in the back of her mind and continues to raise her daughter Susie who she has established an extremely close bond with like Susie was a little platinum blonde haired version of her and she loved it like she enjoyed being a mom a whole lot she just had a very nurturing spirit she loved caring for animals she loved caring for her daughter just all of the things girl anything she could care for when Susie is grown she begins dating one of her parents employees her mother didn't necessarily dislike him but she kind of just she was kind of neutral she didn't really care for him all that much it wasn't anything negative wasn't anything good it was very much a neutral situation that is until things get really serious between he and Susie and then he gets a job out of town so now he wants to marry her take her away with him and Sandra did not like this at all it wasn't even about him it was the fact that she just didn't want her one and only child going so far away from home she did not like the idea of being away from her but there was really nothing that she could do about it because Susie was in love and she was ready to go off with her man and live her life once Susie leaves the two of them Sandra and Susie daughter and mother they're on the phone all the time because they want to keep that close closeness and keep that bond intact. Now, no matter how much they talked on the phone, it still didn't really fill the void that Sandra was feeling. She definitely had empty nest syndrome. She missed her child dearly. And talking on the phone just wasn't, it just wasn't doing it. She wanted her child right there with her. This was particularly rough for Sandra because by now her own parents, who she was extremely close with, she had lost them. So she was really struggling with the idea of her baby girl just moving so far away. Now, one thing Sandra had always held onto over the years was that adorable image of that little chimp down at the rodeo who snatched her candy who tried her in my eyes and she figures okay my child is grown now like sir we can get this monkey now like what's up she felt like now would be the perfect time to go ahead and look into getting her own chimp because why not she got time now her child is grown and it can help fill the void somewhat of her feeling lonely plus sis had the coins to do so gerald is no longer so opposed to the idea he's like girl just okay go ahead she does her research and she finds a sanctuary over in missouri and the timing in which she found them was just about perfect because their chimp susie had just given birth to a baby boy he was born on october 21st making him a libra the breeders at the sanctuary tell sandra that they're more than willing to sell him to her if she you know has the money and she is willing to come to them and pick the baby up which she jumps at the opportunity to do so she makes plans to travel there and pick him up right away now susie the champ she had been very protective over her baby boy so much so that the people at the sanctuary had to actually shoot her with a tranquilizer dart in order to get into her cage and take her baby from her so just three days after giving birth that's what they do. They tranquilize Susie, sneak into her cage, and take her three-day-old baby from her and sell him. When Sandra gets there, she immediately falls in love with this baby champ who is in a whole diaper and swaddled up like a human baby. Now, side note, Susie actually took the loss of her baby extremely hard. She was actually shot and killed a couple of years later in her attempt to escape the sanctuary, which is extremely sad. Like, so sad I wanted to fight. Ugh. Sandra, she takes her brand new baby chimp swaddled in her arms and she names him after her favorite singer, Travis Tritt. I don't know who the hell that is. I feel like I should know though. Oh well. She is just so happy to have Travis finally. She just looks down into his little face girl and just cries. Tears just falling all over the monkey. Tears fell from her eyes right into his as he looked up at her wondering where his mother was took his little monkey paw and gripped her fingers and she just melted at that moment she hands casey the owner and the runner of the sanctuary fifty thousand dollars cash in order to take little travis home 
Sandra and Travis, they stick around for a couple of days and then they board their flight to go home to Connecticut for her to introduce him now to her husband, Gerald. Gerald instantly formed his own bond with Travis. He really enjoyed the company of the champ. Travis spent the next couple of weeks really studying his new owners, picking up on their scents, trying to learn as much of their little language as he could, learning commands, just all of the things, you know, when you get an animal, you try to teach him some stuff. Now, because he was so young when she got him, like I said, he was only three days old. She had to bottle feed him formula like you would a regular human child. She burped him. Like she really treated him like a brand new adopted newborn. She had a schedule for him. She had a crib for him. He had his own room. She would put him down for naps. They celebrated his milestones like you would a regular child, same as she had done with her daughter. And it wasn't long before he was walking around the place getting into things as normal children do. They taught Travis how to use the toilet. They would brush Travis's teeth every morning, eventually teaching him how to brush his own teeth. After a while, he would get up and do his own morning routine. She brought him an extensive wardrobe. He would get up every morning, take a bath. She would dress him like an actual child. Sandra was so in awe of Travis that she genuinely felt like he was a child, like he was her son, her second child that she never had. She felt like she could not have loved him anymore if he had come from her. Like she genuinely loved him as her own son. Now because having a chimp wasn't something that you really just saw every day, Travis instantly became a local celebrity somewhat. They used him in the advertising of their towing company, he would pose for pictures on the towing trucks. He would often ride with Jerry to go out and do jobs. He would actually be the one to greet the customers when they went out to do tow jobs. Like he had it going on. He was very much popular and people loved him. They adored Travis. Travis, of course, has been around people his entire life since birth. So he was very socialized. He was very friendly. He would playfully wrestle with the neighbors. He also seemed to be very aware of his strength. So he would, you know, hold back a lot. Very much self-aware and careful and he knew when to stop. Also very well behaved. And it was just a running joke around town that he was so behaved and he listened to his owners better than people's children listened to them. They never really had any behavioral issues with him whatsoever. And as he got older, he grew even more self-sufficient. He would get up and do chores. He would water the plants, go out there and brush on the horse's hair, get it ready for you girls to make your online purchases. He fed them their hay. He knew how to use keys to open doors. He knew how to log into the computer and look at pictures which he really enjoyed just getting on google girl i don't know what he was what he was looking at pictures of but he would look at pictures and scroll them and laugh he watched tv he loved baseball he knew how to turn on the television and find him a little game to watch he even loved ice cream and he had learned the schedule of like the ice cream truck so he knew when they were coming he would go get money and run out there and make his little purchase child and come back in and eat ice cream and watch mari like the rest of us girls travis had it going on he really did. That must have been a good life to do all of the things and not have a bill to pay. Now, he had reportedly also driven the car on several occasions, just not far, but just around enough to abuse the nearby neighbors. Now, as his independence grew, so did his willfulness. He began to want to do the things that he wanted to do when he wanted to do them and less inclined to just always take commands and do what he's told to do. He was also becoming increasingly and very noticeably possessive of Sandra. He would be very jealous of anything or anybody that had taken her attention even for a moment. He had no problem letting it be known. When Sandra would take a phone call, he would make noise in the background. He would turn the TV up really loudly. If she had been watching the TV, he would start flipping the channel, like just trying to get her attention, trying to get her off the phone. And Sandra had a way of playfully correcting this behavior. She would say things to him like, cut it out, you little son of a she would say stuff like, I'm going to kill you, you little bastard. Like that was her playful banter with him. And then she just laugh it off and she tell the person on the phone, like, can you believe Travis is over here doing X, Y, and Z? Like he's so crazy. Now you remember Charlotte Nash that I told you she had met at the rodeo years before. Her and Charlotte, they had remained good friends and Charlotte would come over every now and then, but not so often around this time. She had a daughter named Brianna. She would bring her kid who she would bring with her to play with Travis. They would sit on the porch, drink them some tea or some wine or whatever they were drinking, girl. And their kids, Travis and Brianna, would just playfully frolic around the porch. These were some of the happiest days of Sandra's life. Things were going great for her. She was happy. Her business was doing well. Her marriage was great. Just all of the things were in place. That is until September of 2000. 
her daughter Susie, who had relocated with her now husband. By now, they have also had children of their own, and she is traveling back and forth between Connecticut and now North Carolina. She has scheduled a trip to come back to Connecticut to retrieve some of her belongings, and she had been complaining of back pain all day, right? She takes a perk before getting on the road that night and somewhere in Virginia her car veers off the road and hits a tree. Now her infant daughter who was strapped securely in her car seat she was completely unscathed. Susie however is ejected from the car and she does not survive the crash. Sandra of course takes this extremely hard. This is her only child. She didn't want her kid to go in the first place and she ultimately blamed Susie's husband. In Sandra's mind he was the reason for her being behind the wheel and relocating in the first place and if she was not having to move and relocate she wouldn't have been in the car accident. She never forgives him for this. Her feeling like he took her daughter from her in a sense, it really made her mourning process a lot more difficult, which I'm sure it was already extremely difficult. She falls into an extreme depression immediately. She distances herself from all friends, all family. She even cut off Susie's children. Like she just, it was just too much for her. She didn't even have anything to do with them at this point. A few years go by and for the first time after losing her daughter, she's ready to kind of get out there and kind of try to get back to her normal routine. She had become open to getting out and just running quick errands, but she would never leave the house and do so without either her husband, Jerry, or Travis. During one of these outings, she takes Travis with her and she leaves him in the car while she goes downtown to run an errand. He's sitting in the car with the window slightly down when all of a sudden somebody for whatever reason tosses the empty soda can into the car at him and it pisses him off. He's highly irritated. He looks out the window to look around to try to see who might be the person that had done this and why. And when he can't figure out who did this, he gets out of the car. He begins pacing the area, still trying to figure out who was the one who violated him and was deserving of these this ass whooping he was ready to give. He jumps at a few of them. Travis was a whole thug out here in these streets, just a gangster. Now he doesn't actually physically touch anybody or put his hands or feet on them. He just kinda, you know, get them a little, like, you know, one of those. When that's not really getting him anywhere, he's still pissed off. He decides, you know what, I'm stopping traffic. He goes and lays down in the intersection holds up traffic refuses to get up and then somebody calls the police finally they're like look it's a whole chimp out here loose in these streets he's holding up traffic he's doing all of the things somebody needs to come do something by this time some of the people who weren't really irritated or negatively affected by his antics they have began to cheer for him they have formed a little crowd a little cheerleading section for travis when the police comes he is all hyped up, ready to put on the show. He is running around from the police, dodging them, smacking them on the butt in between, and his little group of cheerleaders are just egging him on, laughing and cheering. And this goes on for an entire two hours before he finally just gets tired and decides, you know what, okay, I'm done. And at that point, he goes and gets into the passenger side of Sandra's car and puts on his seatbelt. He looking at her like, all right, girl, let's ride. Now, even she had attempted to lure him into the car and tell him to stop, she had went and got his favorite ice cream he wasn't here for none of the things he was there on a mission and he was not gonna stop not even for ice cream no charges were pressed against her for this incident because he wasn't aggressive they kind of just brushed it off as oh he was playing you know so he doesn't suffer any kind of consequences for this neither do sandra and her husband it's just it's just let go. The police who were out here, they actually didn't even take it that serious. They weren't upset at all. They reported his behavior as playful in the reports. And they even escorted him and Sandra all the way home back to their house. But Sandra was a little embarrassed and she was a little pissed off. So she ended up grounding Travis. He spent the whole next day confined to his room on punishment. Now the State Department of Environmental Protection, they called wind of this incident and they didn't think it was as funny. Furthermore, there was a new like law or statute that if you had a primate over 50 pounds, you had to have a permit for him or her, it, whatever. You had to have a permit and they did not have this permit. Even knowing this, they were a little intimidated because he was now like this local celebrity. And so they ultimately just decided to let it go. They're like, yeah, they should have a permit for this beast, but they don't. And we don't want to get into a fight with this wealthy, influential family, like just let's just let it go now although the police and the townspeople they thought this whole ordeal was funny and comical 
Sandra and her husband, they didn't think it was as funny. Like I said, after grounding him, they decided that they are no longer going to take him out in public, period. And Travis really enjoyed getting out of the house. Like he likes getting out, seeing the different people, entertaining people, making them laugh. And so he really did not like this change at all. He was upset by the fact that he is now confined to their home and just any kind of guests that come over and that is like the full extent of his exposure to the outside world. Since being cooped up in the house, Travis appeared to be a lot more bored but he didn't appear to be like unhappy or gloomy. But one particular day in March of 2005, Jared returns home after getting some dental work done. He sits down at the table with Travis and his wife and they're having dinner and I believe they were having spaghetti that night but whatever it was Jerry is tearing it up okay despite his dinner work he is eating mouth wide open and the couple noticed that Travis is very distant like he's not engaging as he typically does he just seemed very sad something was obviously wrong with him he sat there sulking the entire dinner like not saying anything and barely interacting he sat in his chair like turned away from jerry and he refused no matter how many times jerry called his name he refused to turn himself all the way well they both make attempts to try to you know engage travis to bring up his mood to joke with him make him laugh but nothing is helping nothing is improving his mood or demeanor none of it is working jerry says to travis look daddy got his tooth fixed today Travis does not respond he does not look Sandra joins in and she's like come on Travis look at daddy's new tooth still Travis is not he is not impressed he is not trying to look at this tooth he's still not even trying to face Jerome at all he's not here for any of the games not today they make a couple more attempts to coerce him to at least look at Jerry finally he decides to look and Jerry opens his mouth really wide so he can show him where he had gotten some dental work done and Travis looks into his mouth and then he immediately just puts his head in Jerry's chest he just buries his whole face in Jerry's chest this was so odd to them they didn't understand where this mood had come from all of a sudden why nothing that they tried would cheer him up and now why is he acting like this like why is he so sad why is he putting his head in jerry's chest like this they make a couple more attempts to kind of you know lift his mood up a little bit and his demeanor it does soften after this he smiles at them but they could tell like it's a forced fake smile and then he pats jerome on the back and wraps his arms around him and just hugs him recently jerome had begun to complain about not feeling well just an overall feeling of illness he didn't know what was wrong but he knew something was off he didn't think it was that serious so he really didn't take it serious so he began to feel much worse and so then he decides one day after work when he was feeling particularly bad he was just gonna go to the er and get checked out just to make sure everything was okay now this impromptu visit to the er that he thought would be possibly just you know in and out in a couple of hours results in him being admitted when the doctors find that he has a very progressive and rapidly spreading stomach cancer they do not allow him to just go home they admit him sandra rushes to be at the hospital by her husband's side and one day while she's at the hospital jerry he tells her that he needed to talk to her about travis he asked sandy what would she do if something happened to him and if it were to become just her and Travis. Now as much as he said it hurt him and pained him to make this suggestion, he tells Sandra that he feels like if he does not beat this, she needs to give Travis up to a sanctuary immediately. He told her that he loved Travis and he knew that she loved him as well, but he felt like Travis would be too much for her to handle alone and he just didn't feel comfortable leaving her alone with Travis. He tells her that it might hurt but ultimately it's the best thing for both of y'all like it really would be. The first night that Sandra returned from the hospital from spending the whole day with Jerry, Travis smelled her clothes frantically like he sniffed her so hard and long and he was just unnerved. In the following days during Jerry's initial absence of the home, Travis was also very disoriented. He was very sad, very down, like he was extremely depressed. So Sandra thought that it would probably be a good idea if she would allow Travis to talk to Jerry on the phone. When she would do this, he would become so upset, like so emotionally distraught that she would have to take the phone away before Jerry really had much time to say anything to Travis beyond you know hey but she realized that letting him talk to Jerry on the phone was probably too triggering for him she 
cut that out but then he would sit and just rock back and forth for hours just rocking he would take pictures of jerry off the wall and hold them to his chest and just sit when this became all that he wanted to do sandra decides to just remove all of the pictures from jerry throughout the entire house and hide them from him so he wouldn't be able to sit and do this all day on april 12 2005 just a couple of weeks after they had sat down and had that dinner where Travis was initially acting funny and not wanting to, you know, face Jerry. Jerry loses his battle with stomach cancer and he never returned home. And Sandra and Travis both take this extremely hard. Travis had actually been grieving. It's as if he knew that it was coming. And as soon as it became official, like Sandra, she really went right back into a deep depression just like she did when she had lost her daughter she completely cuts off the outside world again just as she had done with the loss of her daughter she refused to talk to any family any friends any of the neighbors it literally was just her and travis now in her mind in her world that's all that existed. They really actually relied on each other really heavily throughout this grieving process. Travis continued to do the rocking even without the photos of Jerry. And when she would cry, like she would lay on the couch and cry for hours and he would just brush her hair and try to comfort her. So not only was he dealing with his own trauma, it was also pretty traumatic for him to see Sandra in the condition that she was in. She was all that he had, so he didn't have an outlet for any of these feelings. He was just there cooped up in the house, trying his best to deal. He's trying to pull himself together. He's trying to pull her together. Like it was just a lot going on. He actually did pretty good though, trying to, you know, hold her together because when she stopped taking care of herself the same way that she used to groom him when he was a little baby chimp, he would groom her. He would comb her hair like a said he would clip her toenails he would file the nails down i don't know if he was bathing her i hope not but he was trying to hold her together as best as he could after more time passes since they have lost jerry sandra is reunited with her friend charlotte her long-term friend from way back in the day she finds out that since they last talked she had really hit a hard time financially and her and her daughter were actually living in a shelter when sandra hears this she feels so bad she feels like you know what i have a proposition for you that'll be mutually beneficial you can live in my daughter's old space rent free just come over into the main house help me out with travis you know help out with the animals around the house and that's pretty much just it it would also be good for her and travis to have some kind of company somebody other than each other in the house or around the house over the next couple of years travis never leaves the house like he is still confined to the home Sandra rarely leaves the house herself. Travis is now 14 years old, 5 feet, and 240 pounds. He was a thick little something. He was not nearly as active as he once was. He mainly spent the most of his time at the house watching TV and snacking or just roaming around the house or the land surrounding the house. He never went far. On February 16th, Sandra and Charlotte, they make a trip to the casino and they decide to spend the weekend down there. They have nice short little girls get away. They're gambling, having fun. Sandra takes Charlotte to get her hair done. She had been wanting to try something different so they got curls put in her hair. She also got it colored just to do, you know, something fun and new. After the weekend is over, Charlotte immediately goes home to her daughter. Sandra goes to the house, but she notices that Travis is extremely irritated. It's early in the morning. He has an attitude. He's very distant. He's ignoring her. And as the day progresses, his mood, it just gradually worsens. She is encouraging him to do some of the things that he typically enjoys doing but he wants parts of none of it he does not want to engage with her or any of the things that he normally would enjoy sis is upset sandra says that at this point she is very much concerned and so she decides to drop a xanax into his mug of tea he does not realize that she has done this i don't even know if he would understand the full scope of what was going on if he did see her do it but nonetheless he finishes the tea and then he grabs her keys and lets himself outside which was something that was not abnormal for him he would go outside sometimes on the porch or just walk around their property. Now while he is outside out of ear's reach, she calls Charlotte and she tells her about how strange he's acting. How she doesn't know what's up with Travis, but he's just being weird. And here's where it gets a little, a little iffy. By this time, Travis was very accustomed to Charlotte. She had been at the house a lot. She often looked after him, helped him out, spent time with him at the house. And so according to Sandra, Charlotte volunteers to come over to the house and help her with Travis and just try to see if she can help, you know, increase his mood, make him feel better, make him laugh or any of the things. And Sandra says, if you want to, you know, you can, you don't have to. According to Charla, 
Sandra asked her to come over to the house and help her with Travis. Nevertheless, however it went down, Charlotte arrives at the house at approximately 3.40 p.m. She gets out of her car, she lets herself through the gate, she pulls up to the yard and she sees Travis there pacing. She had bought along this little red Elmo doll to give to Travis. She felt like this would make him laugh. So she gets out of the car with the Elmo doll like holding it in front of her face in an attempt to cheer him up or make him laugh. But as soon as he sees Charlotte, he immediately charges her. He is running at her. You know how chimps run like on their knuckles and their feet, like the legs and hands. I don't know what the proper terminology, but you get what I'm saying. He runs at her like that, but once he gets to her, he rears up on his back legs and immediately knocks her into her car. When she hits the car, he then slams her into the ground. Sandra can see this from where she's standing and she immediately runs out and she's yelling for him to stop. She's telling him that it's Charla, assuming that he didn't recognize her and she felt like, you know, just giving him this realization would make him back down, but it does not. He then begins tearing into her face. Sandra is horrified. She goes and gets a shovel and she starts hitting him over the back, like trying to get him to stop. Charla is, of course, on the ground screaming in horror and not even for a moment does he stop attacking this woman. His Hysterical, Sandra runs back into the house, grabs a butcher knife, and she comes back and she begins jabbing it into him, like hoping that he would just react enough to this pain for him to stop. But still, it's like he didn't even feel it, like he just kept going. He is now standing over her, still ripping and now eating the flesh, like pulling her apart and eating her. And he is not even responding to Sandra plunging this knife into his bag. She does so a couple more times and initially there is no reaction. And then finally he just stands up really tall, turns around, stares at Sandra in her face like blankly. And then he turns back and continues doing what he is doing to Charlotte. At this point it's very apparent to Sandra that she does not have the power to stop him. She goes and dials 911 and she asks him to send out a police officer right away but the dispatcher is frustrating her and says frustrating me too. And I know it can be a stressful job being a dispatcher. But just looking at the dialogue between them two, it was frustrating. It honestly was so irritating. So of course, when they answer, they ask her what's going on. And she says that her chimp is attacking her friend and that they needed to send an armed policeman right away. The dispatcher is like, who has a gun? says nobody yet girl I need somebody with one Sandra's yelling hurry he's killing my friend and the dispatcher is like who ma'am who's killing your friend girl the chimpanzee girl didn't you hear me Sandra tells her my chimpanzee he literally has ripped my friend's face off someone needs to come out here and shoot him like right away the damn dispatcher is like ma'am I need you to calm down girl how Please explain. And Sandra tells her, I can't. He is literally eating her. 12 minutes. This goes on, child. 12, 12 minutes. By the time the officer finally arrives, he has completely taken all of Charlotte's clothes off and he's walking around the property, just pacing, just walking around. He sees the cop car, he immediately goes for it. He walks up to it, smacks the side mirror. The police officer is like, oh shit. He tries to open up the passenger side door, but it's locked. So then he goes around to the driver's side door where the police is and it's unlocked. And that girl had not tried to lock her door. I would have tried to lock my door and shot sis through the window. Travis snatches the door open. Meanwhile, the officer is struggling to get his gun out of the holster. You know how dogs do like when they show their teeth? Maybe all animals do this because I got an image of a lion, a tiger, and a bear doing it when I said that. Whatever the case, he begins doing that. Like he's showing his teeth at the officer in a threatening manner and then the officer decides, you know what girl is enough for you and starts firing the shots. Four shots in, Travis staggers backwards and then runs into the house. The officer goes over to Charlotte to check her out. She is completely maimed, but miraculously she is still alive. She reaches for his leg and he is stunned that she is still here. So he immediately calls for medical attention. They get an ambulance out there and rush her to the hospital right away. Meanwhile, inside the house, Travis has succumbed to his injuries, child. He was big and bad, but not bigger and badder than four shots to the chest. 
and probably them little stab wounds had something to do with it too i'm sure i don't know because i'm not a trained medical professional now as for charla her nose her eyelids her jaw her lips and most of her scalp were completely torn off she had also lost one of her hands and most of the other every bone in her face was crushed and yet she still survives one month after the attack her family files a 50 million dollar lawsuit against sandra and honey the media tore sandra up do you hear me tore her up they accused her of all kinds of things she did not leave the house for months after this hit the public they accused her of having a sexual relationship with travis and all kind of weird things like this but she said that the thing that hurt her the most was the fact that people claimed that she cared more about travis than she did her own friend which she said simply was not true she said if that were the case she never would have attempted to go get the knife she never would have called for an armed officer to come out here and assist like she was like that is just ridiculous and it's not true and she felt like it just really painted her in a horrible light and despite how much she loved animal's child that was not the case for a long time she sat inside the house and refused to clean up travis's blood it just it was just there on everything that he touched and she just roamed the inside of the house sad and depressed and not speaking to any of her remaining family members or any of her friends it was just her her horses and her dogs and in the end much like the beginning all that Sandra really had was her relationship with her animals she would put food bowls outside for the raccoons she would feed the wild deer from her hands like she really just threw herself into caring for her animals and the wild animals that surrounded her property and that's literally her world she found another chimpanzee that she really liked named chance but she knew that she could never have another chimp at her property like she had travis like she just she knew that would never be a thing for her again so instead of her taking it she had a friend physically keep the animal and she will fly in and periodically visit she would send all of the money that it required to you know raise him and feed him and all of the things. This way of life pretty much continues for Sandra for a couple of years until one evening she is complaining of chest pains and she decides to go to the hospital. Now it turns out that her aorta was protruding and so they rush her into emergency surgery but two hours into her surgery she flatlines and so that is pretty much the end of this sad story i don't know how i ended up getting here doing this sad ass story i think it was requested some time back but it's terrible it's just so many people to feel bad for this whole story was just completely utterly sad i felt bad for literally everybody involved obviously i feel the worst for charlotte because she is now having to live with these scars which out of respect for her and to keep from triggering you guys a whole lot i've not inserted the pictures i just wasn't comfortable with it but you can google her name and find them easily they're all over the internet sandra lost her family so i felt bad for her too but the thing is i ain't gonna lie i was a little pissed off at sandra honestly because i felt like this is the thing people have this money and they feel like they can do whatever and i know it's gonna be somebody in the comments that compares what she did her taking travis to people like myself who have adopted animals straight from like a pet store or a puppy mill or from a breeder and i get the comparison but i think it's a difference between a dog and a cat versus this chimpanzee like I don't feel like that they are meant for this domestic lifestyle I feel like it's very selfish of us to want them as pets and confine them to our space they're not having any kind of access to any animals that look like them we're forcing our little domestic lifestyles and ways of living on them and it's not natural for them like that is not how they're meant to be out here in these streets girl waking up brushing their hair and their teeth and putting on an outfit like that's not the life for them furthermore he was really kind of being rewarded for his bad behavior granted they grounded him for what he had done and stopped taking him out in public but when he would do things while she was on the phone in the background it wasn't taken serious so it kind of created the space to where he felt like he could do whatever honestly it definitely began to blur the lines for him i believe so it started to feel like he could do whatever he wanted to do not saying that what he did in the end was sandra's fault but i feel like there were things that were done that led them up to that point now as far as that day i'm kind of torn because on one hand i feel like no he didn't recognize charlotte and that's probably what initiated the whole thing but what would make him feel like he had the right to attack anybody like that and two don't animals identify you by smell like okay yeah they might see you first but i'm sure he got her scent and so i'm sure he knew 
who she was, which leads me to further believe that it was just done out of jealousy. That Charlotte had begun to come around when it had just been him and Sandra for so long and he really just wanted it to be them. She had just taken Sandra away for a weekend and that's why he was irritated, I believe. And when she came back, he was just pissed. Like he just wanted to take it out on her. I don't believe that he did not recognize her and that's why he did what he did. He definitely did recognize her. He snapped. I also felt bad for Jerry, obviously, but you know what this also reminds me of? Because I think animals they might not know every illness and sickness but i think they know a lot of them because let me tell you a short story that happened to me and blue about two years ago now so the fourth of july weekend was coming up and i had planned on going out with like my family somewhere but i wasn't feeling good i don't know what was wrong with me but i just wasn't feeling good so that friday i spent the entire day in bed now mind you when i say the entire day all I did was get up, walk, and feed Blue. But what I noticed was he was very clingy. Like, he wanted to lay in bed with me under the cover. He wanted to cut, like, lay against my body. For the most part, he's a clingy dog, but he will go off and do his own thing. Like, now I'm filming, he's off doing his own thing. He'll go take a nap by himself. He'll go grab a toy and toss it around. Like, he will go off and do his own thing sometimes. But he was not letting up. Like, he was right by my side. And mind you, I don't really feel good. I noticed that he was being clingy, but I'm just like, well, hell, I'm not up and doing anything. So maybe that's why he's less inclined to get up and go do his own thing. But one thing that I had not realized is that I had not eaten anything or had anything to drink since the day before. I'm in bed all day. The entire day goes by. I don't eat or drink a thing. The next day, I had a prescription to pick up, so I was like, I need to go do that. It's hot, mind you. It's summertime. I get my ass up, out of the bed, put on some clothes. Lou is still really clingy. He literally has been by my side the whole time, barely allowing me the opportunity to even get dressed and put my shoes on. Like, he's just doing the most. So because he's super, super clingy and he's not letting up, I'm like, okay, you can just ride to the store with me. I typically take him out riding with me anyway. Now I use the Kroger pharmacy, right? Which is inside of a grocery store if you don't know what Kroger is. I walk around the store for a bit, grab a couple of things, not too many things. I probably had like three or four items. All of a sudden, I felt like I had never felt before. Like, I don't even know. I can't even describe the feeling to you right now. Probably could be described as lightheaded, maybe. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm just about to go check out. I need to go over to the pharmacy, get my stuff and go. I got to the pharmacy counter. The girl gets my birthday and my name. Next thing I know, it's me and the paramedics. It is the paramedics girl. And I am flat on my back girl looking up at him in the lights of the store. Now they of course already knew who I was because I did give the girl my name and my birthday. So she knew a little bit about me. Girl, I'm laid out on the floor. And I hear this helper behind the counter talking about, she looked like she had a seizure. He asked me a couple of questions and he's like, well, bye her answers I kind of can rule that out and she is just persistently saying sis that I look like I had a seizure I said well this is the thing obviously I fainted I had never fainted before but I always imagined if I did I would go down like a Disney princess like you know like real cute like <sighs> like that so to say that I'm sitting up here looking like I had a seizure I remember thinking I'm about to beat this bitch up Miss Girl, I'm gonna need you to relax because right now you're embarrassing me and I don't need that kind of stress on top of this stress. I was pissed. I'm like, girl, will you relax? Like, I'm literally like, can somebody shut her up? It was a hot ass mess, honestly. I'm like, girl, relax with the season. And I was especially irritated after he told her like, no, she obviously did not have a seizure, ma'am. She was just hell bent on telling them I went down looking crazy. Child, by this time, I'm embarrassed. So I just want to go home. I'm like, I don't want your ride in this meat wagon, girl. I feel fine. The store manager is right there. By this time, they had asked me, like, when was the last time I ate? When was the last time I drank anything? I told them roughly about two days ago. And they were like, girl, as hot as it is, like, you literally out here on E. You ain't ate nothing, ain't drank nothing. You're probably dehydrated. And so the store manager, he goes and gets me some water and some chips, girl, and a little sandwich from the deli. And he's like, don't even worry about paying for it. I'm like, girl, you gave this to me. You think I was worried about paying for it? It wasn't. Honey, you volunteered these here snacks. Now, what about the stuff in the basket? Can I get that for free? Like, how bad do you really feel for mama? Let me know. Show me. Nevertheless, they made multiple attempts to try to get me to agree to take this ride in the ambulance. They had checked my glucose and my blood pressure. Both of those were normal. So they really were just thinking that it was just dehydration. And I was like, girl, it don't sound serious enough for me to take this ride. I'll follow up with my primary care physician. I wanted to just get out of there. Girl, I'm already shamed. I'm already embarrassed, girl. They still made me sit there for 45 minutes before allowing me to go home for me to find out that in the process of all of this, 
this. They have lost my keys, girl, and my dog is in the car. Y'all forgot Blue was out there in the car, but the windows was cracked because you know I don't play them little reindeer games, y'all, and I was not gonna risk my son's life in any kind of way. So his windows were cracked. The store manager, he looks around for my keys. The girls from the counter, they look around for my keys. We can't find the keys nowhere. They're like, are you sure you had them at the time that you fainted? Like, I'm like, girl, I don't remember. Then let me tell you what she said happened. So she said that after I gave her my information and she went to pull it up, she said I immediately tried to walk away. I turned to walk away and she was like, ma'am, like you haven't gotten your prescription. Where are you going? And she said, I turned back, looked at her, walked back to the counter, and then I went to fall and I tried to catch myself. But then I just hit the blow child. I had a nasty bruise, like covering my whole arm for where I hit it on the counter. And then apparently, allegedly somewhere in there, I look like I seized. But we ain't got to keep talking about that. It was like the worst day ever. And this is the thing. I have a horrible habit when I have two keys, leaving my spare inside the car. Window was not down enough for me to stick my little finger in there, girl, and unlock the door for myself. So I had to call out a locksmith to open up my door just to get to my spare that was inside the car. So then I was able to crank that girl up and ride Blue home. After the fact, once I got home, I called my mother. I knew not to call that girl before then because she was going to freak out and do all of the things, which she still did. She was like, why would you drive yourself home after the fact? You could have passed out again behind the wheel. That was dangerous. Why didn't you go to the hospital? Just She just did the absolute most, girl. Just all of the things. So I'm like, girl, I'm at home now. I'm good. And she's like, no. I'm on my way. I'm leaving work. I'm like, you don't have to leave work, girl. Just relax. I'm fine. She's like, I'm on my way. What if they say what's wrong? I'm like, they assumed that I was just dehydrated. And then she calls my older sister, puts her on three-way. My older sister is like, this is what, she's so calm. She's like, this is what you have to do for dehydration. You need hydration. I'm like, girl, obviously. And then my mom is like, she's frantic, so she's not even thinking. Because I'm sure in a regular conversation, she would know what to do. But in her frantic state of mind, while she's grabbing all her shit off her desk, she's like, how do you do that? What does she need? I'm going to this store. And my sister's like, water. This shit wasn't funny in the moment. I swear this is how it went. She's like, water. And then probably popsicles, Pedialyte, something like that would help. I'm like, girl, bring me some fruit, girl. Hell, that's why you at it. Just going to get all my groceries, girl, because I fell out before I could just finish shopping. My mama went to Sam's Club. She's so dramatic. She went to Sam's Club and got me a case of water. She got me grapes from Sam's Club, girl. She got popsicles from Sam's Club. I probably got some of them damn popsicles in my freezer still right now down to the bottom of the deep freezer. And it's been two years, almost. It'll be two years this year. She did everything. I'm like, girl, I'm literally one person. Like, girl, I'm not going to sit here and eat all these popsicles and grapes. Miss ma'am? Damn, I just thought about how stressed Booth probably was sitting in that car the whole time. She showed up. I ate the popsicles, girl, a handful of the grapes. I was laying in bed. And it wasn't until she got there that Blue actually left my side. When she got there and she sat on the bed, he hopped down and he went on about his business. Like he had been relieved of his duties and he needed a break. And so, yeah, dogs be knowing. They be knowing, but they can't even say nothing. It's like, girl, what's the use of having a power? You can't tell me to tea. But that is pretty much it for this story and this video. I hope you like the look. I feel real cute. I'm about to hop in my car now and take these foundations back before we go past the statute of limitations on those girls. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed the look. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up on your way out. Share this video with a friend. Comment your thoughts down below. I feel like every video, I'm like, I really want to know y'all thoughts on this one, but I really do on this one. Just like all the other ones, I guess. I'm actually stockpiling right now so I don't know if this video is on a Tuesday or Thursday so I can't even say see you see you Tuesday see you Thursday girl because I don't know what day it's gonna be y'all have a good weekend a blessed week before then as always I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and I cannot wait to see you in the next one peace I'm in love with a stripper not blue judging me from the hallway I'm like I finally got a daddy and he a stripper Sandra Harold, she was born in Stanford, Connecticut. Is it Stanford with the N or F or N? What am I talking about? Stanford. Stanford is a college, right? Child. It's going to be Stanford with an M today. Sandra Harold was born in Stanford, Connecticut. Connecticut. Why did I say it like that? I can't get past this first line. Not only that, Gerald actually held on to over the years with the left always held on to over the years with why can't I say was always held on to over the years with was girl
she immediately blah, blah, blah. Susie, who had briefly until the year, I was gonna say the year of September, girl. September and the year, blah, blah, blah. She has scheduled a trip to come back to Connecticut to retreat, blah, blah, blah. And lays down in the end, in, blah. This is where I'm about to, this is where I'm about to still get a little emotional. Okay. Girl, why am I breathing like I'm gonna have a baby? The first night that Sandry, Sandry, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna shed no tear, girl. On April 12th of 2000, okay, come on, come on, girl, you got this. Girl, now my eyelash hanging out, telling that I have been crying, girl, oh my gosh. Charlotte is reunited, not Charlotte, damn, that's the friend's name. This is the setup, this is how things, blah, blah. Charm, what was up in the garage, I mean? She reaches for his leg and he dials 911. No, he dials 911. Girl, he the damn police. He called the paramedics. Jeez. <laughs> meanwhile, back inside the ranch. Not the ranch. What am I talking about? See, every time I say meanwhile back, I want to say meanwhile back at the ranch. What is wrong with me today? <laughs> Her family filed a 50,000. No, not thousand, girl. Because that would have been a fool. <laughs> I already got a pimple. I can't take nothing else right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Peace. So you gonna snore right there on my outro? I'm leaving it because I'm not redoing it because my mouth dry.